Hi, everybody. My name is Kyle Fox. Thank you for joining the first ever FedDev, an OpenGovCon event. Uh, this is sort of an experiment. What we're trying to do here is to connect the contributors of open source software, the users of open source software, with technology leaders in the public sector and private sector so that we're building better digital infrastructure together. So today, I'm excited to have one of my good friends, Dan, here uh, provide a really rich set of content that talks through how we build software that is safe, secure, and effective in highly regulated environments, and how to do it in a way that's repeatable, that follows commercial best practices like GitOps patterns and things like that, uh, so that teams are able to not have to reinvent the wheel every single time. So again, with that quick intro, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Dan. Awesome. Hello. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, so today, uh, my, my name is Dan Fedick. I'm a solutions engineer here at HashiCorp, and welcome to FedDev. Um, if you want to find me on the Twitter, I'm at Dan Fedick. Um, that's, I'm also on LinkedIn and other places. I don't really post much, but you can find me there if you'd like. Um, so today we're going to talk about, you know, I, I actually work at a company called HashiCorp, which is the, um, the, the maker of Terraform and Vault and a bunch of other platform tools um, that I'll actually review today. Um, and we're going to talk about HashiCorp's multi-cloud operating model and zero trust and how all of our tools can kind of give you access to um, build, provision, secure, connect, and run any application across any environment in the cloud or on-prem. And before I do that, I just want to introduce, I guess, myself. Um, again, that's me. Actually, before we get started, there's a um, URL here. It's the bit.ly 3PP. So this URL here is how you're going to get, if you want to actually ask questions in the virtual room, this will get you to a Slack channel. Sign into the Slack channel. Um, and in that room, we'll have access to the lab. And we'll have access to this PowerPoint deck so you can bring all the resources that are in links to this. Uh, you can bring this home and you can work with it. After today, you'll be able to take this home and actually use that link um, to do the labs at home. So we're going to be reviewing Terraform and lab format, uh, console, vault, and boundary. So when, after, this, after today, after you've had all your questions, you should be able to go home and actually review this and rerun the, the lab as many times as you want over the period of the next two weeks. So um, in that case, I, I put them in the general channel in that Slack room. So, um, but before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about the company because we don't, a lot of people actually know um, some of the applications that we have, like Terraform or Vault, but we don't really know who HashiCorp is or what we are. Um, so, HashiCorp is a commercial company. We're public on the stock market, um, we're HCP on the stock market, New York Stock Exchange. Um, we primarily started off as an open source company, and then we have offered enterprise options for all of our tools, for most of our tools. We have a product line of eight applications and another one coming um, that's more around the development and, the U and UI, UX. Um, but for, for right now, these are the eight platform tools that we have. Uh, we actually divide them uh, based on where they fall in our, what we call the cloud operating model. So in our infrastructure tier, we have Packer and Terraform. This is our images as code, our infrastructure as code. Console is our um, service networking or service registry. Boundary is our um, like zero trust network access uh, tool. Vault is our secure credential and uh, credential management application and identity broker. And then we have at our, in our applications here, we have Nomad. Nomad is our orchestration tool for running applications. And those applications could be anything from a container, like you'd run in, in like a Kubernetes environment. But we can also run VMs. We can run Python scripts and Java jars. We can run basically anything that you, um, that you have as a workload. We can run in an orchestrated environment in a very large scale environment. Um, Nomad, actually, one of our interesting talking points around Nomad is our largest Nomad cluster is 100,000 nodes and 40 million containers all in one cluster, which is pretty impressive. Um, and then we have Waypoint and Vagrant. Vagrant was actually our first application. Um, Vagrant was kind of the developer standard for standing up applications quickly for development environment. So if I wanted to spin up a dev environment for my developers, I could basically codify those steps and then do a Vagrant up and then have a development environment to work through. And then Waypoint is a newer tool that we have that allows us to deploy applications across multiple different types. So like 
Kubernetes, I have an EC2 instance with a load balancer in front of it, I've got some bare metal infrastructure. Waypoint allows us to codify those different types of deployment methods and then do a waypoint deploy. Um, so it's a common, the idea is that we wanna be able to provision, secure, connect, run any application across any environment and deploy um, with a common workflow. And that's the biggest thing here. And that's where the multi-cloud operating model comes from. So when we first started out, I don't know if, how long have you guys been doing this for, but I've been doing this since around 96. So for some people that's the young guy in the room, for some people that's really old. Um, so t 96, I started working uh, in the military on some, you know, some interesting physical servers uh, that did some cool stuff in the military. Uh, but, you know, we, after that, I kind of left the military and did a lot of the commercial things, like right? racking and stacking servers and data centers all over the place, uh, from AOL to um, marketing analytics platforms to Oracle. Um, and, and over that time, you know, I learned a lot about server storage and network. But then all of a sudden there was this point where I actually went and I, I helped start a startup. Uh, the startup was called Zaius. We were a marketing analytics platform. And we had to make this decision because we were right on that precipice of, hey, are we gonna adopt the cloud as, you know, as a first class citizen in our environment or are we gonna actually stick with virtual or physical servers in our you know, physical data center? So we ended up doing a hybrid approach, of course, because um, we were all used to the physical traditional data center, but we started to move certain workloads out into the cloud some of those you'd want to, like, for, the biggest thing we wanted to do is make sure that we could scale our application. We want to be able to scale that out. You know, we actually had a Super Bowl ad that we wanted to, to work on, and that took eight, we went from a modest 200 uh, users a second all the way to like 50,000 users a second, all in a period of like an hour, which was an insane amount of bursting, but we couldn't do that with our normal physical resources. We had to scale out into the cloud. So when we move into the cloud, you know, whether that's your private cloud, your AWS, your Azure, your GCP, your OCI, or OCP, whatever your, um, your cloud environment is, you're gonna have new, a new dynamic environment to work in. And with that dynamic environment comes a change in thought, right? We have new principle that the principles that the cloud introduces. And we break this up into four layers, main layers from a platform perspective, right? So, the first layer down below here is the infrastructure layer. I kind of um, alluded to it earlier in the earlier slide when I was talking about the company itself, but we have the infrastructure layer. We went from this world of a traditional data center where we had static servers, they were racking and stacking, and now we're using infrastructure as code. We went from a security model where the IP address was the standard for security, like this, we want to grant permissions from a firewall perspective or grant permissions from uh, a VPN to a specific IP address. And as we move into the, the public cloud, we can't do that because IP addresses are brittle, they're not as dependable because they go away all the time, right? So we're moving to a new concept of, of security based on identity. As we move up the stack, we went from host-based IP addresses now to a service base. So we're actually moving up the OSI model to the application layer as far as um, connecting different applications together. And at the application layer, in our multi-cloud operating model. We went from uh, multiple applications, I actually don't understand why they have multiple, multiple, but we have multiple applications. We're actually, think about monolith versus microservices in this layer, right? So now we're moving into a microservices world. We're taking this monolith and we're breaking these different functions up into actual services that we can then scale differently based on what the application does. And with that comes all these different principles, but also different endpoints, right? So now if I'm in VMware and I'm in AWS or I'm on-prem, I have now new ways to do infrastructure as code. I have new ways to do security, right? I have my identity providers, LDAP, Active Directory, IAM, Azure Active Directory, GCP IAM. I have all these different identity providers that I'm working with. Now I have different endpoints for that. For networking, I have you know, VMware's NSX, CloudMap, OpenSM, Google Istio, or just Istio in general using Kubernetes. And at the application layer, I've got a million different orchestration tools, Docker, Swarm, uh, ECS, EKS. So we have a different way to do all these things and everything's very dynamic now. It's not just load an application server onto a physical server and turn it on, point to the IP address from a firewall and we're done, right? So things are moving around a lot more. And where we kind of come in to have a conversation is really in the infrastructure security and networking. And even at the application layer, um, we, 
Nomad is our first class citizen from a HashiCorp perspective, but we also work perfectly with Docker Swarm, with Nomad, with ECS, with EKS, with any of the Rancher tools, console and vault. Uh, Terraform can provision that infrastructure, vault can secure it, console can connect all the different applications together just like an Istio would. So we're gonna go over some of these tools today um, in, the, in the labs. So as we've kind of moved into this model, um, we, we've shifted from the traditional data center. There's really three stages, right? The first stage is, okay, like I went through this process. We have, we're now gonna start turning on servers in the cloud. What do we do? Well, the first thing we do is we start figuring out what the cloud is. We log into the console, we figure out how to create a server. Well, that server needs to go in a, v, a VNet or a VPC, and that server needs to have security groups and route tables and all kinds of crazy things. <clears throat> well, we learn how to do that by clicking through the console. Now, the second time somebody asks me to do that, I'm gonna get kind of annoyed that I have to do the same thing. And then it's not only an annoyance for the platform team, but it's also, um, it, it, you end up creating uh, resources that aren't the same. So you have these disparate one-off servers that aren't tagged correctly, that have different IP address schemes and all kinds of differing, different things that you need to actually take into uh, account. So as we move forward into stage two, we start standardizing, right? We're no longer clicking through the console. We're now thinking through things like, let's build a platform team that can manage all these tools. We are uh, building infrastructure as code. We're creating modules that we can share with different organizations. We're creating policy as code. We're creating images as code so that we can create common patterns and then share those across different organizations. I was talking earlier about um, Spotify. They, they have this concept of a guild within an organization or, or a community of practice. And normally what you'd have is multiple teams working together. So multiple teams are using Terraform. Well, why don't we share as an organization the modules between those different organizations? Right, so now I can just take those different modules and I can just change the variables based on the, organ the, the application that I need to use um, in the future. And as we scale even further to the right, now we've taken all these things from the public cloud and we can actually move them back into our private data center. Right? We can actually say, hey, let's create a private cloud that uses the same tools that we use in the public cloud. And now we can bring some of those, um, those learnings from the public cloud back into our private estate. And obviously, the, the three big things that we talk about a lot, uh, this is kind of funny because I always forget what the three big things are. It's cost, risk, and speed, CRS, uh, which I think it's funny because it's the old can't remember stuff. Um, so yeah, anyways, cost, increasing efficiency, manage cloud spend, right? So for me, when I was running my platform team at Zaius, I always had to know what was going, coming in, what was going out from a FinOps perspective, as the financial operations, right? I needed to be able to tag all my resources. I needed to know what this part of the stack cost us, and then how much is that delivering as far as value is concerned. Um, as far as risk is, is concerned, this is something that, that means a little bit more to the government, well, a lot more to the government. We need to be, because we have an increased risk to um, attacks, you know, our critical infrastructure, is, is always under pressure. Um, our, we have weapon systems, we have DOD organizations that are all under pressure as far as risk and security is concerned. So how do we reduce that risk and centralize policy enforcement? And we'll talk a little bit about some of the features that we have with Terraform and all of our other products uh, where we can add policy as code into the workflows of these applications. And then speed. When I was deploying applications, the first time I deployed and I was clicking through that, that application stack, it took me a good while to do it all. The, we'll call it the 10th time that I did that same thing over and over again because I'm a slow learner, I was able to then just change a couple variables and then redeploy all those applications. Um, and I was able to get to market or we had um, a time to mission was a lot faster, right? So I was able to get that application out the door in a day or in an hour versus a week of me trying to click around and do things. So again, HashiCorp partners with uh, basically on the cloud operating model. Again, our layers provisioning infrastructure um, with Terraform. Packer, just kind of, I wanna reiterate what Packer does for you. Typically, once you provision your network resources, you then have to build a server. That server needs to start somewhere. It's usually starting from some sort of golden image. Well, how do you create that golden image? Well, you take a Windows or a Linux base, you, you turn it on, you run a bunch of scripts or a bunch of commands on this uh, clone, and then you basically take that clone and you make another clone of it and you save it somewhere. Well, Packer allows you to 
to codify that whole process and do a packer build and then push out all of those artifacts out to the different regions you need to push them out to. This is, you know, and you also get the benefit of using CI CD workflows and build jobs. So you can put it through that same governance, that same um, approve, approval mechanism that you have to if you're a developer and you want to approve your code, right? As you move up to security, you know, boundary and vault, console with the networking, and waypoint and nomad for our application stack. So this is kind of where we play. It's squarely in the app dev slash platform team. So we're really, anybody who's working in this stack is usually supporting the app dev team. It's usually a platform team. Um, and, and the platform team concept has kind of um, evolved over time because we've, we've gone back and forth with DevOps, DevSecOps, platform team, but, the, but this is kind of the uh, squarely where the platform team lives. Um, everything from provisioning the infrastructure to deploying the applications in support of that. So our first product that, you know, is at the base layer of this infrastructure or of the cloud operating model is Terraform. And after we go through some of the features of Terraform, I'm gonna, we're actually going to do a uh, instruct lab on Terraform and we can actually walk through like building Terraform code and, and basically show you what this looks like. But the biggest problem with the multi-cloud, you know, we went to a dynamic environment, we're going multi-cloud, and, and when I say multi-cloud, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're using Google and Azure and Oracle. It could just be that we have an on-prem presence and we have one cloud, right? Now we're multi-cloud, right? We have private cloud and public cloud. <clears throat> so this can be very slow because we have new, you know, dynamic um, endpoints that we have to hit. We have new things we have to learn. So how do we make this a faster process? We do it through infrastructure as code. So what you see here is a picture of, um, you know, the practitioner is kind of the, the platform engineer, right? He's writing the infrastructure as code. He can start with modules that are in our public registry. We have thousands of, of modules that we can use in the public registry. In some government organizations, uh, it makes sense to put restrictions on the type of modules that we're borrowing. We should put scanners around a public module, but these are all public registry, just like you would have like a Docker hub, just like you would have um, a GitHub. If you were gonna borrow somebody's code, you have to go through the same mechanisms of code scanning um, and the life cycle of software that you're bringing in from an open source perspective. The practitioner borrows from the community or can write their own modules and then they can run their plan and their apply. So the plan and the apply is basically, hey, I'm about to build some infrastructure. What is it gonna look like? And it'll actually, a plan will show you the code that you wrote and then the, the resources you're about to build. And the apply will actually go out and actually apply those out into the world. Um, we have, like I said, this looks, looks like here we have over 2,900 providers. So all these different providers, you can do everything from um, provision your Kubernetes stack to provisioning VMs, to provisioning uh, resources in your Cisco, your Palo Alto, your Prisma Cloud, all the way to provisioning a pizza if you wanted, right? There's actually a Papa John's provisioner if you wanted to uh, actually borrow, uh, maybe we should do that today. That should be part of our thing is order a pizza in here. That'd be kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, because we're using the open source providers, we can actually borrow from the community, which is very important, especially as an organization like this, where we can use um, other people's work and, you know, as part of the open source community. What you see here is an example of two resources that are being built. One is a instance in GCP and one is a DNS record that actually uh, points to that. Everything with, within uh, Terraform is actually written in what we call HCL. HCL, if I was to put HCL on the political uh, spectrum, it would be a moderate, right, where YAML would be this a beautiful, elegant language that only cares about human reading. And JSON is this very structured uh, but fast way to do things over here on the right. So, um, and we have multiple commas and the machines rip through that, but then the YAML, the, the, it's really made for humans. HCL is a little bit of both, right? Because we not only have to read the, infra the actual code, we actually have to write it as well. So writing it is very simple. There's a lot less commas involved. Um, this is an example of those two resources. Um, and you can see that there's dependencies between the two resources, right? The second resource depends on the first one. And you can see it points, that value points to the value that outputs from that resource. Um, it's declarative, Turing complete language. Um, and then we also have versioning that comes along with using GitHub um, or Git uh, connectors. 
So as you can see here, we can do Azure DevOps, AWS, Bitbucket, GitHub, GitLab as the kind of mechanism for Git repository. So we can write the code, put it in our VCS repository, integrate that with our code. We can do branching and forking just like a developer could. And we can put those through our normal uh, CI/CD workflows, including things like approval, which is very important when we're trying to actually do things in a, govern a, a governance manner. And we want to make sure that all of our applications have approvals before they get deployed. OK, so oh, also, I said we can write in C uh, HCL. That was the, the, the first language we were writing in. But we also have the CDKTF, so Cloud Development Kit for Terraform. If you're already an application developer and you want to write in TypeScript or you're, you're used to Java, I don't know why you'd want to write in Java for de deploying an infrastructure. But you know, hey, um, we've got Python, Java, C, uh, C Sharp, and Go. Uh, to provision that infrastructure. So if you're already familiar with a, a programming language, you can use that with the CDKTF, which is really nice. And again, we're going to reduce risk, reduce costs, and reduce uh, increase ag agility by using um, and adopting this infrastructure as code. Again, version control system. Um, this is a picture from our, our enterprise or our cloud offering that shows actually policy as code and version control from a plan and an apply. So what happens when we're using our cloud or enterprise, we can actually see a change happening in our VCS repository. That change kicks off an automated build process, um, and it can run a plan or an apply based on how you actually set that up. Um, you can say things like, if it's on this branch, then do a plan. If it's on this branch, do an apply. You can put policy checks in. It's very, it's very nice as far as like, hey, I want to be, I want to act as if we're developers, which this basically is development, uh, but you're developing actual infrastructure. Um, we also have, so this is Terraform Cloud and Terraform Enterprise, um, but GitHub app authentication. So if we're going to communicate between uh, the Terraform product and GitHub app, app authentication, we can do through with their um, actual application authentication instead of just a token. And infrastructure state. So just kind of a little bit about Terraform and how we manage state. So we have our, you saw the resources that were written in HCL. That's in a documented language. If I'm in the directory with that, that main.tf, so it's a Terraform file, um, I, I do a plan. It'll actually read through that. And then it'll actually say, okay, is there a state file here or wherever we tell the state, where, Wherever we tell Terraform, the state file is going to be. It can be in the cloud. It can be in an S3 bucket. It can be locally in a JSON file. We tell that infrastructure, uh, we tell the cloud where we want that infrastructure state to live. And then it says, OK, you're about to build this. What's out there now? If nothing exists, it'll create a, a state file. A state file is literally just a JSON blob with a bunch of infrastructure that's already there. And then it does a diff between what's about to happen and what's there already. So what it, what it shows you. These are all the runs that happen, and then they actually tie to git commit. So you can see the git commit here um, is tied to all these different runs. Um, and then it'll actually show you, this is what I want to show you. In this, actually, I just found out I could do this. This here is when we do a plan, you can actually see the resources that are being created. And you can say, hey, all these green uh, pluses here means that we're actually going to build new infrastructure. If it was a change to existing infrastructure, you'd see a yellow tilde. If it was a deletion of existing infrastructure, it would be a red minus, right? So you know, hey, I'm about to do this infrastructure change. What's going to happen, right? So instead of um, you know, the green, you'll see a, you know, a bunch of minuses or, or changes. At the bottom here, you'll see what's changed. You'll see that um, you know, we, we apply it was complete, we added one resources, we changed three resources, and we deleted something, right? So you can make changes, and it'll tell you beforehand and after what happened or was about to happen. This is really nice. Um, and with Terraform Cloud and Terraform Enterprise, it actually shows you more in a UI model, but this can be done from the command line with the Terraform command. One thing I didn't mention about all of those tools that we saw up on the board, those are all open source tools. We do have enterprise offerings, but all of our tools you can download today um, from, from our website at HashiCorp.com. So Terraform, Console, Vault, all the stuff we're going to do today can all be done uh, with open source tools. You can go download. Last but not least, we have our, actually, 
one of the last things are Terraform runs. Um, you can actually go back and see all the runs that have happened, uh, which shows you your state. Um, and then modules, this is really important. So again, just like a developer would create a new module if they were doing the same thing over and over, you know, it's, we have the dry concept, right? Um, you, you don't wanna do the same thing over and over again. So you create a module or you create a library or that you can actually use later, right? So in the Terraform world, it's, it's modules, right? And I can store those modules in a public registry. I can store them in a private registry. If you're using Terraform Enterprise, you can, there's a Terraform, uh, a private Terraform module that you can say um, your organization had a set of uh, library policies or security policies that you wanted to share within your organization. You could put those in your private registry and everybody else in your organization can use those. Um, this makes it a lot faster, right? So I can be a developer and I wanna just be able to have a new server with a load balancer in front of it with my Route 5.3 record or my DNS record. And I can quickly take that module that was already pre-created because it's something that I do over and over and over again. I created a module for it. All I gotta do is grab that module, change some input variables, and then now I can deploy my infrastructure out into the world. Again, the three big cost, risk, and speed, right? We're using modules, like the biggest use for me was, I would actually look at, you know, I started walking through the SRE handbook from Google. One of the things they talked about was actually walking through um, your toil, right? What is the toil that I do every day? I'm getting the same tickets, I'm writing, DNS records, I'm, I'm adding users, I'm updating vault credentials. Those are the three things like, I felt like I was doing all the time. How could I put that into a module and then write it so that I can then tie it to something like a ServiceNow or a JIRA ticket? So if that came in, I could actually, once it was approved, I could automatically apply that using Terraform to build it out in the infrastructure. Again, that's a great way to increase speed, right? And reduce risk because we can actually have the same way we do things every single time using those modules. Policy as code, I kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, all of our enterprise tools has a, have a, um, an application called Sentinel. Um, Sentinel is our policy as code framework. Uh, with Terraform Cloud, we can actually um, check against a policy library to see if, uh, we, we can do things like um, check if an S3 bucket is public, right? So when, we, when Amazon first came out with, with S3, when you'd create a bucket, it would automatically create a bucket and it would automatically be public. So a lot of people were creating buckets not realizing that they were in their VPC necessarily, and they would create public S3 buckets that were available to everybody. Um, we can create policies that say, no, don't do that. We can create policies that say, hey, if you're gonna spend over $500 a month or $1,000 a month, ensure that you're not, um, you know, or, or put, put a uh, constraint around how much money you're spending. So if you do spend, you're trying to spend over $1,000, somebody's gonna get notified. Um, so these are guardrails that you want to add in. Um, and, and a lot of days, especially today, if you're in the government, you have to deal with a lot of policy, a lot of governance. Um, we're going to go through a little bit um, of the actual rules and regulations, but all these can be codified. So if we have some dusty handbook somewhere or some PDF that says, here's all the rules you need to abide by to actually be operational, to meet an ATO, we can write those and codify those with policy as code. Here's an example of some policy as code. Um, you know, we're basically saying here, uh, make sure that if you're gonna deploy, you have to use it with this specific VM size. So you can create a list of all the VMs you're allowed to use. And you can say, if it's outside of this list of VMs, like don't spin up an i3 metal XL5, whatever, and it costs you $50,000 a month with, you know, when you spin up five of them for a cluster by accident, um, that would actually be triggered, right? So there's a bunch of things you can do from from a, uh, a cost perspective, from a policy perspective, from a, you know, governance is concerned. Um, and then you have different options for these permissions, right? So I can say, I can have an advisory warning. So that plan runs and says, hey, you're about to spend over this amount of money, you probably shouldn't spend that much money or at least talk to your boss. You have a soft mandatory where an explicit override is required. And you have a hard mandatory, which basically blocks provisioning. Like if you're trying to provision an S3 bucket and that's something you're not allowed to do, in a public, a public facing S3 bucket, it's just gonna all out fail. So that, that job won't run. So if you think that, about this from an ATO perspective, um, from a government perspective, that I'm trying to get an authority to operate, I might have a list of you know, 300 items from a, you know, from a STIG that I have to go STIG my environment out. What if I could codify all of those different events into a policy framework? And I can use that 
So before I deploy my infrastructure, I can check against this policy so that I never deploy infrastructure that isn't, doesn't meet these requirements. This is a pre-ATO almost work, right? So if somebody comes in, you can say, here's the libraries that we used. Everything that was deployed went through this system, and, and now you can do your ATO knowing that. Um, we also have policy libraries. So if you go out to the public registry, the Terraform registry, it's registry.terraform.com, I think. Um, you can actually look up policy libraries. So we have GCP, Azure, AWS best practices for policies. So you can actually go out and see those. We're actually talking about um, working with a lot of the government organizations to see if we can come up with our own policies uh, or, or have somebody um, publish those to public registries for existing like CISA or NIST requirements that we can use and, and apply against our infrastructure. So some examples. Uh, this is some NIST policies, right? We have our security and privacy controls for information systems. We have our zero trust architecture framework. Engineering trustworthy secure systems, right? These are all policies that we can apply before we deploy infrastructure into the cloud, whether that's your private or your on-prem. Then we have the CISA, zero trust architecture, right? Our different pillars. And we're gonna go through some of these pillars today, right? Identity, um, networks, application workloads, data, governance. These are all things that we help uh, touch. So we don't touch every single one of the pillars, but there's a lot of them here that we're, we work through, right? Out of all of these, I think, I mean, there's not many we don't touch, right? Identity devices, network, application workloads, data, uh, visibility and analytics. We have metrics on everything we, ha we do. So you technically have uh, the ability to make sure that it's always monitored. Um, we can also do audit logging. Um, automation orchestration, that's Terraform. Governance, that's policy as code. And at that, right now, we're actually going to go through Terraform in the lab, and we're going to go through and actually work on uh, building out some infrastructure with our lab. So I'm going to go back to my laptop here, and we're going to start that lab, and I'll walk you all through it. Let's see if I can... If I can remember, while we're doing that, let me just check the Slack channel and make sure nobody's asking any questions. Okay, cool. I'm going to go to the general channel, and then I'm going to go to the lab in here. So at this following link, hands-on with the following link. So I click on that, and I should come to a page that has a few um, con pieces of content for us. Today, we're going to go through the infrastructure of, uh, to Terraform on AWS. We're going to do that first. And then we're going to do a little bit more talk around Zero Trust and how HashiCorp works with Zero Trust. And we're going to go through uh, building an application, uh, securing the credentials in that application, and then um, creating a PKI CA between our applications. So all of our NPE or non-person entity communication of our applications can all communicate securely with least privilege. And if we have time, we're going to do an introduction to Boundary, which is our tool that allows us to access those credentials from a network perspective. So we're going to go through the introduction to Terraform, so we'll hit the start on that. And it takes a little bit because we have to actually spin up an environment, but this is infrastructure as code on AWS. We have a couple, um, one for Azure if you're interested in that. Um, anything that you'd like to see from a HashiCorp perspective, we probably have a lab on it. You can hit me up either on Twitter um, daniel.fedic at hashicorp.com. You can hit me up there, and we can get ac give you access to all kinds of resources um, just to get people hands-on. So this takes a couple minutes. Um, so the Terraform command line tool is available. So that's one thing. All of our tools are basically written in Go. So for the most part, we should be able to download any of our tools if you can go to releases page on HashiCorp site. We can get all of our applications. They, as long as you can compile Go, you can run it on that platform. So Mac, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, Windows, Solaris, Linux. Um, this goes for all of our other tools as well. So Terraform, um, I'm going to run it. In this, we're going to run it on a Linux machine. Um, Terraform language is designed to be both human and machine readable. We talked about that. Um, mod, yeah, so if you use VS Code, you can use the HCL uh, syntax highlighting. Also, there's a, there's a command in here. I don't know if we're going to go over it, but if you're using that syntax, 
Um, if you're in a Terraform directory, you can always type in Terraform validate to check to see if that Terraform is clean. And then also you can do Terraform format to actually format it and make all the equal signs with the linter, basically. I think we'll probably go over that a little bit today. <clears throat> so again, Terraform, um, from an open source perspective, is literally just a binary. It can run on anything. Um, the, you write the code and you put it into a directory. Anything in the directory where that Terraform exists, is looking. For, if the Terraform command is running, it's looking for a .tf file. So I can break out my Terraform code in you know, as many ways as I want. I can put it all in one file, or I can break it out for my readability into things like variables files, input and output files, um, local files. I can break you know, outputs, all kinds of stuff. Um, so we're going to hit the Start button here. I just want to make sure we can see everything. We're good? Okay. Okay, so up top here, in all these Instruct Labs, we have the ability to create separate tabs at the top. So what you're seeing here is just a shell editor. Uh, we also have a code editor, so we can actually look at the code from like a VS Code type um, application. So this is what they were talking about, the syntax highlighting, right? Um, saying when you edit any of these files, you'll see a blue dot and a disk location. So just in, in general, this is just telling you when you're making a change to one of these files through the code editor here, like say I added an enter here, you'll see a little uh, floppy disk in the tab. If you want to make a change, you actually have, have to hit the save button or, or the floppy disk, and that'll actually commit it to disk. Um, I think it's just one of the features of, of this code editor they're using. So you can see here we've got our main, our outputs, terraform.tf vars, and our variables. And we have our licenses all in the same directory. And then we have our shell command, and then we can do uh, terraform show, right, or something like that. We can run the terraform command. It's all available here. Um, so we're just going to hit the check button. So at the end of each one of these tracks, so when we enter this, we were in a challenge. Um, or sorry, we're in a track. Each one of these new, um, we'll call it events here, or basically they're all different challenges within the track. So we just went through the first challenge, which is basically just look at the different way, ways that the instruct is set up. So Terraform Open Source is a command line application you can download and run from your laptop or virtual workstation. Again, written in Go. Um, you can run wherever you want. Okay, so getting to know Terraform. I'm in the directory, I've got some Terraform code here. First thing I wanna do, just to see what version of Terraform I'm using. Another thing about this um, Instruct platform, if I don't wanna type, I can always just hit come over and actually click on the code block, and it'll actually copy it into your buffer. It just makes it easier to, to do this if you don't feel like typing. And then you can paste it, Terraform version. Okay, so we're using 1.1.4. There are newer versions of Terraform. Uh, we're not going to update Terraform right now, but uh, it's as simple as going out to the web and downloading the latest version. Now, when you create Terraform, um, your Terraform code is versioned based on the version of the Terraform binary you're using. So there are some different features. As, as Terraform upgrades itself, as we make changes to the Terraform binary, uh, the, there's some code block things that change, right? There's certain things about the code that can change. So you just have to know, and that's why we actually have a block within Terraform that says, we're using this version of Terraform to apply this code. So Terraform version, of course, there's a Terraform help. You can see all the different versions here. We have init, validate, plan, apply, destroy. And then, um, again, you saw the code editor. You saw those different versions here. And yes, we do know that the HCL stands for HashiCorp Configuration Language because we already talked about that. <clears throat> okay, so first step is, hey, I want to create some AWS infrastructure. So in order to authenticate to AWS and build those resources, Terraform requires to have what's called a backend um, appropriate for an IAM policy, or, or it's the provider. So let me just show you real quick. Say I wanted to build um, some, some AWS resources. The first thing I would do is I'd say um, Terraform... AWS provider. So there's probably a provider from, there's a provider for every major CSP, cloud service provider. 
Um, in this case, we're going to use the AWS. So if I click on this Terraform AWS provider, I'm using the, the standard AWS and HashiCorp built AWS provider. The first thing I want to do is look at use provider. In here, you can actually see that we, we provide a, um, a provider block, right? So in this provider block are things like, we want to use the AWS provider. We want to use the provider version 466.1, right? So those can change based on you know, new features that AWS are coming out with, right? So if AWS comes out with a new version or a new, uh, maybe a new tool, and they want to add that in, they have to bump their version and add the code for that new AWS resource. And then the configuration options are, are things like your AWS credentials, the, the region you're going to work in, that kind of stuff. So this is the first step I always do. I'll look for the provider, and I will actually go in here and, and see the example. So you know, the AWS provider is, is one example, but they'll show you all of the different inputs, um, and, and they'll show you examples on how to use the provider below. So back to our, our Instruct Lab here. Uh, for this training environment, we're going to actually use the AWS access key and secret access key given to us by this Instruct Lab. So with Instruct, we, we can say, turn on AWS, and they'll actually provide us root-level credentials for an AWS account. Um, no spinning up you know, Bitcoin mining uh, while, we're, while we're in here. Um, you've got two weeks. It'll turn off after a few hours of us using it. So, um, but you can use these AWS access keys uh, in here, and then once this lab expires, the keys go away, the whole account goes away. Um, so you can see here, echo, you can just type these commands in, echo, and you can see those are our creds. You should see the valid AWS keys. I can do something like, um, I don't know if the AWS commands are, yeah, AWS STS get caller identity. Oh, I guess it's not installed, I thought it was, Never mind. Well, you could do that if you had it, but, but you do have the keys. So Terraform will still work with just the keys because we're using the provider instead of our AWS binary here. All right, as we move into the next one, it just kind of talks a little bit about the different types of files. So Terraform will read anything. I talked about this a little bit, .tf or .tf vars. Uh, by convention, Terraform workspaces will contain a main.tf. This is kind of this is a pretty strong convention. Main.tf, um, the variables and the outputs files. Those a lot of people use. I actually break out a providers of variables and outputs a tf vars file. Um, and if sometimes I'll do things like what they say here, a load balancer.tf. If I have a huge amount of code and I want to break those up so I can quickly get to the resource that I want to, maybe I'll put the load balancer.tf in a separate file, and then I'll be able to get to that um, pretty quickly. Okay, what does Terraform code look like? Um, we'll just do a, again, here's my three files, main, outputs, and variables.tf. So, so what do they do though, right? So we have, there's two types of variables. We have an input variable and an output variable. That's the first step. So an input variable is declared in your variables.tf. So if I cat my variables.tf file, I have all my, my variables that I want to declare, right? So when I say I declare them, that means I can use them in different ways. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll set same defaults. So you can see here in this variables file, we have a default equals something. Uh, in, in, the, in the admin username, we have default equals HashiCorp, right? So if I'm in an, uh, a production environment, I might have a set of declared uh, pre-provisioned variables that I want to be the same as same defaults as possible. And then if I want to make a change, I can still write an override. I can declare that variable and apply my own through a TF vars file. And I can say, no, I want the username to be defetic or whatever, or the height to be 600, I don't know. Um, and then we have, so those are input variables. Those are variables that we would take. So for example, if I was writing a module and I wanted to um, give the ability to change the instance type. I would have an input variable that would say instance type, right? So if I want to just create a small instance, a micro, I could say instance type equals and then the variable for um, the instance type I want to use. Um, and then we have output variables. So an output variable is the value that I want to be able to take somewhere else, right? So I've created all these resources. I can go, def uh, I can go find the resources that I created 
and I can um, access those resources and then use them somewhere else in a different set of code, right? So I can have a remote state from that, that state file that I'm using. So I can say, hey, you've created an instance or a VPC. Um, almost everything I do is going to be in a VPC. I'm probably going to have to know the VPC ID. So I, I declare the output variable as a VPC ID, and then I can go pull that into some other Terraform code. And I can say input variable is data.resource.vpc.vpcid. And I can use that instead of having to change the input variable every single time that VPC changes or the subnet changes or the uh, route tables change. Right? Those can automatically po be populated downstream to other different types of resources. Um, you'll, you'll see here that we have, I don't know if we're going to go through this, but I'll talk about it. In our input variables, we have orders of precedence. Right? So our TF vars file is the variables that we want to, um, pr to override the standard variables.tf files. We also have locals, uh, a local variable. That's something that you want to change if you're going to uh, maybe write some code on the fly as I'm about, you know, at runtime that I'm about to apply. I can then call out and then write, write that, take that variable and then write it into my variables file and use it in my code. So that's it for these three files. So we got our main, our variables.tf, which is our input variables, and our outputs, which can be used in other resources. <clears throat> okay, like I said before, we have um, we can go out and browse the providers at this registry URL. Um, and we can actually, there's, like I said, you can do anything from provision AWS to other cloud service provider resources to order yourself a pizza. You can do whatever you want um, as long as there's a provider for it. So you can go out and browse the different providers you have. This is very important if you're running, so a couple other ways that I use providers. You know, if, if you're using something like CloudFormation, CloudFormation is very good. I like CloudFormation. However, it works on AWS resources only. So say I wanted to provision my Snowflake database, which is a data warehousing SaaS platform, or my, um, my GitHub repos. I want to make sure that every GitHub repo has a specific set of tags. They're a part of a team. There are specific things that I want to apply to that GitHub repo. I can do that through Terraform. I can use the GitHub provider and provision all my GitHub um, repositories the exact same way. Um, so you can do things other than just AWS resources or GCP resources. You can use your, your SaaS providers, and you can even write your own provider. We have an open source um, provider language, so you can actually write your own provider if you want to do things for yourself um, and, and build your own provider if you're, if you're in the app dev world, which a lot of people here are. Okay, so I've built my Terraform code. The first thing I want to do is init that Terraform code. The init process will, will go out and say, okay, you're using this provider. I'm going to go download that provider onto my local directory. And that's what uh, you'll see here when we do this Terraform init command. It'll create a provider's directory. It'll also create um, start a state file. It can be empty if we haven't done anything yet. So we're going to do this Terraform init first. Okay. It's automatically successfully initiated, initialized, initialized um, and then we have a dot .terraform directory. So cd2.terraform, you can see there's a provider's block. All right, so we're going to do a quick check and move on to the next challenge. It's quiz time. So if you'd like, we'll ask questions and you can answer in the Slack channel. Uh, providers and modules, where does Terraform store its modules and providers? Anyone locally want to answer? I'm gonna check the Slack channel in case anybody's actually answering. Looks pretty clean in there. <laughs> the answer is in your .terraform directory. And I hope I answer this correctly so I don't get in trouble here. There you go. That's right. <clears throat> okay, I actually did talk about this as well. Um, Terraform has a built-in syntax checker. You can do a Terraform validate. So if I'm in that directory, I can run the Terraform validate. It'll check to make sure that all of your Terraform code is written in the proper syntax. Um, 
the Terraform validate command is actually run whether you run validate or not when you run a plan. So if I do a Terraform plan, the first thing it does is do a validate before it actually checks the resources. It'll just check the format. So let's just run that real quick. All right, the configuration is valid. So another thing I'll do just to show. All right, there was something in my main.tf file. Actually, it's probably the space that I entered in the code editor a while ago. Um, you can actually see that main.tf, that spaces. Well, the space is there. But basically, if these were off, let's just do this, save it, and then we'll run that command one more time. Terraform format, hey, it found something in the main.tf, and then you can see that it changed the, the syntax there. It's just a linter. It's nice to, to be able to read your Terraform code. All right, we'll check that. Okay, we talked about the Terraform plan earlier. The plan, again, is gonna look at the code that you've written the variables, the outputs, all of your main.tf and your tf vars files. It's gonna see, okay, I have a state file that you've declared. What is the difference between what's in that state file and what you're asking me to do? Um, I'm gonna be able to, I'm gonna either create, delete, update some sort of infrastructure, and I'm gonna do the diff, and then I'm gonna show you what's about to happen. In the case of what we're gonna do now, we're gonna do a dry run, so just using the Terraform plan command so if I do Terraform plan, um, it's asking me to fill in. Okay, so there looks like there was a variable that was not that was declared but not defined. So if there are situations in which you've declared the variable and you haven't defined it in a config file, it's going to ask you to fill it in. So in this case, we're going to put prefix. Um, it's saying a short string of lowercase letters or numbers. We're going to call this fed dev. And we're going to do a check. So now it's, whoops, that's not what I meant to do. Darn it. Let me go back to that. Can I go back? Uh, I apparently can't go back in this one. Um, either way, it would have done the plan. Let me see if I can actually do a plan again. Terraform plan. Um, there's a lock file. Let's see. All right, well, we're gonna just try to do a plan with lock equals false. I think because I actually went through too fast and hit the next button. Uh, dev. Okay, Terraform init. There we go. That's what we were trying to show you earlier. Okay, so I added the prefix, um, and then it, it said, hey, there's, there's no state file, so now I'm going to go create some infrastructure. Um, and, and the state file that I'm going to compare it to has something in it, and this is, this is all the infrastructure and the attributes of that infrastructure that I'm about to deploy. Okay, so in this case, I'm creating a VPC. We're going to call the VPC HashiCat. Um, I think the end goal here is we're gonna actually create a, a cat application where we can see different cats in different, um, uh, on a website. In this case, we're gonna use the CIDR block. So this is actually using the AWS VPC resource. In that resource, if you actually go to uh, the registry here, you, you should be able to just do a search on AWS VPC. So if you ever are trying to figure out like, how do I deploy this, um, you can do, either a module, like the Terraform module for VPC, or the Terraform resource. A lot of times I'll just do AWS VPC resource Terraform. And that usually gets me there faster than if I look for it anywhere else. So 
in this case, you can see at the sorry at the bottom all of the input variables that I have options to. So if I was going through the AWS console, I would still be asked a lot of these questions. In this case, I'm able to pass these in as attributes um, on the command line. So you can see here um, the module. You know, we, we passed in CIDR block. Um, ID, probably some tags. Yeah, so it actually added the fed dev VPC tag, um, and it tagged all of the resources in the state file as fed dev VPC US East 1. So we're going to do a check. Ah. Okay, so I have to read. Open the Terraform TFRs file and set your prefix variable by deleting the... Oh, okay, so they want me to do this by doing this to the Terraform TFRs file. And I'm going to take this out. So it was actually checking to see if I did this, and I did not. So I'm going to save this terraform.tfr. Again, this is actually declared in my variables.tf. It's the first declared variable. And because I've declared it there, but I haven't put a sane default, it's going to ask me. So I can override that with my terraform.tfr's file. And that's what this is. So I uncommented that, and I'm going to save it. I'm going to run the command one more time. Control C. Okay, so you can see, uh, did the same thing. Now I'll check it one more time. Do a quick check. Phew. I think I'm back on track here. <clears throat> Again, just like we said before, you can override those variables that are in the variables.tf with anything in terraform.tfr. So there's an order of precedence. It's local file. Uh, or a, a local variable, terraform.tfrs, and variables.tf. And also, if you run something on the command line, you can actually type in terraform plan, and then you can pass in dash dash variable. That actually will override anything in the, in the terraform.tfrs file as well. Okay, in the previous challenge, we set our prefix variable in the terraform.tfrs. Let's set another variable that will determine the location of where your AWS infrastructure will be deployed. So this is the region. First, run another plan so you'll be able to compare what happens after you change the location. So uh, we copy that. We're going to run a plan. Terraform plan dash lock equals false. All right. Um, add a region variable to your terraform.tf. So I'm going to go back in my terraform.tf file. Uh, where do we go, region, TFRs file. And we're going to add a new one. We're going to call it region. And we're gonna, I like US East 2 because it is cheaper than US East 1 and way cheaper than US West 1. So I'm going to save that and run the same command. Once you've set your region variable, try running Terraform plan again. We did that. We should be able to see the difference now in our tags. Instead of US East 1, it now says US East 2. And US East 1 was the standard variable that you saw in the variables.tf file. So we're going to quick check. All right. We're going to do one more test here. OK, where are Terraform variables usually declared? On the command line, as in vari environment variables, in the variables.tf, or in the terraform.tfrs. Anybody know? What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> in the variables.tf file, that's right. So, there's the, so the variable.tf is the instantiation of the declared variable. And then we'll just check that. All right, we did good here. But we can use all of those different options to write overwrite what's already declared in the variables.tf file. Uh, Terraform Graph can provide a visual representation of all of your infrastructure. This is handy when finding dependency issues or resources that will be affected by change. So if you're like me and you're a visual kind of geek, um, there are some tools. So this is going to we're going to go through this, and there's some tools here that we can use with Terraform Graph that will actually show us um, a visual representation, but I've actually heard of people doing things like UML 
or Mermaid to Terraform Graph, use Terraform Graph and then actually apply it to um, an actual PNG file, create an image, excuse me, um, which is really cool. I think that's pretty neat. Um, terraform graph. So we're going to run this graph command and you can actually see the resources in a, uh, I think this is UL. So it generates code that can be used to create a virtual map. The graph data is in dot graph description language format. Um, so dot graph. In this case, we're going to learn more. We're going to use um, a tool called blast radius, which is a free tool. And it can be found here at this GitHub repo. So first we have to start up that blast radius server. All right, now we switch to the Terraform Graph tab. Hopefully this works. It looks like it's started up. Um, and then we explore the Terraform Graph. So we should be able to go over here and actually see a graph of all of our, so this is uh, UML. Um, it basically shows the, the variable and then the attributes of those, those variables. Um, if we were using things like functions, you, know, you could see those as well. But as you start to kind of grow the, the size of um, this Terraform state file, you'll have a lot more resources in them. So you could have giant resource graphs. Um, and then the good thing is that you can start seeing how dependencies, basically they use Terraform Graph to actually do a Terraform plan or apply. And the way they do that is by first creating the graph and then it shows all the dependencies. So that this is done internally within the Terraform binary. And it knows which order to, to apply the infrastructure based on this Terraform graph. So for example, this variable is the, the Terraform provider, uh, or the AWS VPC is dependent on the Terraform provider, so it has to do that first. Um, you know, the, these different variables are dependent on the resource. So you can see these, and, and this Terraform graph is actually the order in which Terraform will go through and provision the infrastructure. So if you have dependencies, it'll always do the um, origin dependency first before it does the, the follow on the downstream resources or variables. Pretty cool tool. Um, again, these could be done in uh, Mermaid now. If, uh, I've seen a bunch of other ones. Um, and the nice thing about Mermaid is you can render Mermaid graphs in your, um, in your Git repo. So if you're writing Markdown, you can actually create, you can use this as part of your CICD workflow. You can generate an image, put it in your Markdown automatically, and then anytime you go to that repo, you can see exactly what's deployed. Kind of a cool feature. Okay, by default, the Terraform apply command runs a Terraform plan to show you what changes we want to make, right? So apply actually runs the Terraform graph, the Terraform validate, the Terraform plan. And then it says, hey, this is what you're about to do. Are you, are you sure you want to do this? Um, and then it'll actually apply it out into the world. So again, we'll see our Terraform plan. We'll probably get this crazy error. I'm not troubleshooting on the fly here. I'm just going to keep going. So Terraform plan shows all the infrastructure we're about to uh, provision. Terraform apply does the same thing. Terraform apply, and we're going to throw that flag on there. Whoops, Terraform apply, Terraform apply. All right. So the first step, it did the graph. It knew which order we're going to create the plan in. It shows us the resources that are going to be generated. It shows us that this plan is gonna create one resource. It's, gonna, it's not gonna change anything. It's not gonna destroy anything. So do I wanna do this? Yes, I absolutely do. And now it's gonna go build it. The cool part is you get to actually watch it while it's happening. So if I was in the AWS console, uh, if we actually had a tab for the AWS console, I should be able to go to my VC, VPC tab and actually see that being created. When this is done, like it is now, I can actually see what resources were created. Um, it says apply complete resources, one added, zero change, zero destroyed. I can also type in a Terraform show, and you can see all the different attributes that I have. So the, the output variables can actually dig into this resource and grab attributes that are a part of this resources that were created. So right now we only have, um, we actually don't have any outputs. Um, we just have, I have to do a Terraform show to get to those. But if I wanted to take one of these attributes and use them in a different workspace or a different um, state file, I would have to do a remote state to an output file that was in this. And I'll, I'll kind of explain that later. But basically, I can put an output, I think we'll go through this, but an output file, create an output variable, 
and maybe I'd want to get the VPC ID. That's oh, it's almost always what I do when I'm using um, AWS v when I'm creating a VPC. Is I always want to have that set so that later on I can go grab it, especially if I'm doing things like creating an instance that's or in a Kubernetes cluster or something like that where I need to have access to that VPC ID. We'll do a quick check. Okay, Terraform is an idempotent application, meaning I can hit apply, and I can hit apply again, and I can hit apply again, and nothing changes as long as I don't make a change to the config. So I can run plan and apply as many times as I want. The good thing about this is if I want to do something like drift detection. So what drift detection means is um, I make a change in Terraform code, and then Yash, my friend who I work with, goes in and he makes a change to the code. And, but he actually, he goes into the console and he makes a change to that same thing. He adds a tag. The next time I go to run my plan or my, my apply, now there's a difference. And I'm seeing it in my plan going, hey, I didn't do this in code. This isn't in my Git repo. What happened? I used to run a, a nightly job that would actually go out and build, uh, that would actually go check that Terraform plan. And it would actually tell me and page me if there was a change in the drift. Um, Terraform Cloud and Terraform Enterprise now have drift detection built into uh, the enterprise products. So you can actually see that drift. You can have it monitor you or, or alert you if things have changed, if somebody's gone in through the console. That way it's not going for too long. The problem in a lot of infrastructure is you make a change on Tuesday and you don't realize you're about to do, you, you don't realize you did anything, but then a month later you go to touch that infrastructure again and now you don't know why there's a change, right? So drift detection tells you right after you've done it in the console, it'll say, hey, there's some drift. What happened here? And then you can kind of address it as soon as it happens versus a month later when you need to go touch that infrastructure again. Okay, so uh, test and repair. Try running Terraform plan again and see what happens. Of course. Since your VPC has already been built, Terraform will report that there are no changes, right? Um, now try running another apply. You should see the same thing. Terraform apply. No changes. So I can run that apply as many times as I want and actually not have a change. Um, so this is the nice thing about using drift detection is you can run this command over and over. And then, you know, every night at midnight, you run this plan, and if there's no change, then you don't do anything. The job, fit, you know, the job's successful. Um, this is something that if you're doing testing, uh, nightly tests, like we used to have nightly jobs, this is one of the big ones that we did. Um, and from an, from a, uh, if, if I'm writing code, I'm always gonna write tests, right, against that code to make sure that when I deploy my code, I know it's, it's good, right? And I can test against that later on, so I don't have to have QA developers everywhere. I can have the QA developers write the tests, and then that, that test can be run every night, nightly, hourly, whatever, or before I'm about to deploy this into production. The same thing goes for uh, Terraform. All right. Okay, so we can create, destroy, update in place, recreate your infrastructure. So, so one of the nice things about being able to you know, use Terraform is your backups have to be, um, th they can be different, right? I don't have to have these giant backups that store the state of my infrastructure. Instead, I can just back up my JSON file and recreate my infrastructure from scratch. It used to be that I'd, we, we'd take a backup and we'd put it on a disk somewhere and we'd store that disk in a folder or a direct, you know, in a, a file cabinet somewhere and we'd use it if we needed to. Instead, we can just say, here's the steps that we took to get to that endpoint. And now we can just do a Terraform apply because we've codified those steps from beginning to end, right? And that's a, you know, a, a 50 meg file or a 50K file versus a, you know, 300 gig disk that we're borrowing. So Terraform can create, destroy, update in place. Um, always tries to match the current infrastructure to what's been defined in code. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to edit the TFRs. We're going to change the prefix we're gonna add a new number to the end of it, right? So we're gonna take our terraform.tfrs file and we're gonna call this, instead of FedEx, a fed dev, we're gonna call it FedEx. That's my, my last name. I think that's appropriate. 
um, TFRs file, and then we're going to do a Terraform apply. Okay, now we should see there's a change that's about to happen. And this change is most likely just going to be a tag change. Right, so this is a, a great version. Um, you can see here it's going from tag name fed dev to tag name fedic. Um, again, it's my last name, so that's. Um, and you can see that instead of adding something, we're just going to change it. Now, if I was actually going to change uh, or, or destroy the VPC, you know, say I just took that entire resource out of this main.tf file, it would actually go out and destroy that entire VPC. So we're going to say, yes, we want to apply that infrastructure. So it's going to find the existing VPC, modify the tags, and I should be able to do a Terraform show and see that the tags have changed. And you can see down here, they're no longer fed dev. Okay, so it's just saying it's a non-destructive action, so we could just modify something instead of destroying it. So now we're going to add a new tag to that VPC. So instead of just changing one that exists, we're going to create a new one. Uh, read the Terraform documentation for AWS VPC. And we're going to go in here. So just so you know, again, you can go, if you look up a Terraform resource or Terraform registry resource and then the resource name, say you're going to create an S3 bucket. I would always in Google go Terraform S3 bucket resource. And it would bring you to the page uh, to build a resource for S3. And it gives you basically the first part of this is your resource block. So let me just zoom in here. You've got your, the, we're, we're instantiating the fact that we're about to build a resource. The resource name is AWS VPC. That's the, that's the type of resource. And then the name that we're going to give it. In this case, we're going to call it main. Um, and we're in this, if this little example here, we're only passing in one variable, which is the CIDR block. And then at the Again, at the bottom here, you can actually see these are all the input variables that you can change. So these are all the different arguments, starting with CIDR block, instance tenancy, all kinds of crazy things you can add in here. A lot more than you actually get from the, the console. So the nice thing is, if you go into the console, they give you kind of like best practices. Um, you know, here's the five or six things you probably want to change, but there are a ton of extra resources that, or resource attributes that you can change. And those are all listed here in the Terraform. So you can actually get more out of Terraform than you could just going through the console UI. All right, so we went there, add a tag to your VPC resources in the main.tf. So in our main.tf, we're going to add an additional, what are we doing here? Key equals value. Read the examples carefully, unlike other resources. Talking and reading is hard for me. Okay. Read the examples carefully. Unlike the other resource arguments you've seen, the value of tags argument must be a map. Okay. Um, let's try to find an example in the documentation. All right, so name is equal to main. So we're going to add a new one in this VPC. And we're going to add conference is equal to fed, uh, open govcon. All right, and then we're going to save this, and then we're going to run a Terraform apply. All right, whoops, with our fancy dash lock equals false. This is not normal, having to type that in. There's something going on because I skipped it earlier that I don't feel like troubleshooting live. So, okay, so you can see here, um, resource AWS VPC, we went from just having the name to now having conference as an additional tag that we can add in here. Again, tags are super important. Why do you need tags? Um, again, if I'm going to um, provision infrastructure for a team, maybe I want to have a team flag, or I have an organization ID, maybe I want to have an organization flag, or a role, or an environment, or maybe even, um, well, you can take all these different attributes and then actually apply billing based on those attributes as well. So if this was a project that I was working on and I wanted everything in that resource block 
to have these tags applied to it so that later on I could figure out how much money I'm spending on all these resources. I can go to the AWS billing and then do queries on the different tags. So I can build nice billing out uh, statements so that if I want to charge back to my customer, I could do that through my AWS billing, right? So we're going to hit yes here. And we're going to apply. Um, this was built at OpenGovCon, so we got a new conference. So if I ever needed to know um, who to charge, um, I would charge OpenGovCon here at Linux Foundation. Yeah, it's good. All right, so we got that changed, and we'll check that real quick. Incorrect. Did it actually ask me for an environment? I didn't type it in. Okay. <laughs> uh, key value, and it's an after environment. Oh, environment production. Man, I should probably try to read. Let's see. All right. Save that and run it one more time. My apologies. Shell. Terraform apply. Whoops. Okay, now we should see the change one more time. Do you want to do this? I sure do. You can also pass in um, a, you know, always say yes, enforce it. Okay, so we've changed it, and now I should be able to check because there's an environment tag now, and hopefully it works, but it didn't. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Maybe because I have the other one. We're going to skip this. Um, is that why? <sighs> okay, I want to do it now that you said it. <laughs> Save. Two attempts. You think we can do it this time? It's like a scorecard at the bottom here. Okay, phew. Well, at least this, this worked, but. Ah! <laughs> Is it lowercase in my room? Anyways, we'll just skip that. It looks good to me. It's probably because I have um, another tag in there that I wasn't looking for. Okay, Terraform code can be built incrementally, one or two resources at a time. So this is really nice. So. When I first started using Terraform, that's kind of how I went about it. It was like, okay, well, I know that I need a VPC. So let's just build a VPC. I'd build a VPC. And then it's like, okay, well, what else do I need? Well, I need a server, right? So how do I do that? Let's get the Terraform uh, AWS instance resource. So I built that. And then that was dependent on a load balancer. So I'd build the load balancer. I start stacking all these different resources in one configuration file and then applying them one at a time. And then I could destroy the whole thing and reapply it, and it would destroy all of the infrastructure, and then re recreate it. Um, okay, so I'm going to read this this time. Open the main.tf file again and uncomment the next resource block in the file. Okay, so it's going to basically go to the main.tf. They cr they created a AWS subnet here that we need to access. I think I can do this. Nope. Okay, so now I have another resource. I can save this. Um, uncomment the code by removing the comments. Now run Terraform apply. Okay, cool. And then do I save it? I don't remember saving it, but we'll try. Okay, so now we have the VPC. It says, hey, wait a minute, you've got a new resource in here. What do you want to create? So it's going to create this new subnet. It's going to be in the CIDR block for this VPC. Um, we're tying it to this. You can see the VPC ID here. It's already created. So I'm going to hit yes. Hit return. And again, I could go to the, if I had the console, I could bring it up and show you that now, hey, we've created some subnet groups um, and we've created a VPC. So we've changed it there. And that should check out perfectly.
Okay, this is what I was telling you before, that are you sure that it keeps asking? You can type in dash auto dash approve, um, and it won't ask you that question, it'll just do it automatically. In the Terraform Cloud or Terraform Enterprise versions of these things, um, you can set it up so that every time you commit to like a Git repo, it'll automatically approve it, or it'll actually wait and ask you um, in the UI, so you actually have to go in and manually approve it. So we'll do our Terraform plan. All right, so we know that we're going to, it looks like it uncommented something in the resource block, so we'll just take a look at that. Yep, so now we've got more stuff in here. They uncommented everything else that was in that file. So it's gonna, we're about to build all kinds of fun stuff. Um, so this is just a plan. So we're gonna say Terraform apply auto approve and I'll just add our lock in here. Lock equals false. Now it'll just go out and build it. It can take up to five minutes for the application to finish. Um, I guess at the end of this, we should be able to bring up a web application in a new browser tab by clicking the URL in the cat app URL output. So this apparently creates a public URL that we're able to hit at the end of this that has a cat in it somehow. So this is gonna be a surprise for everybody. So you can see here, if, let's actually go back into the code editor um, and kind of go through what, what we're doing here. So, all right, so we've got, this is our, our provider block. I, a lot of times what you'll see is the, this top part, this Terraform provider, and then the configuration for that provider a lot of times I'll take that and put it into a providers.tf file. And that, you know, just have this information, but like I'll know right away that, hey, I need to make a change to the provider. I need to upgrade it. I'll do that in my providers.tf file. Then I'll just list all my resources, right? In this case, the VPC, the subnet, security groups. These are all the different attributes I want open. So it looks like they're gonna build um, this hashy cat application and it's gonna be available. We're gonna be able to SSH to it, get to it by port 80 or port 443. We're gonna create an AWS internet gateway, a route table to it. Um, you can see what version of Ubuntu they're using 18.04 still. Uh, they should probably upgrade that. Um, we're creating a, a null resource. So what a null resource does for you is it allows you to do things like SSH to the server, right? So in this case, it, it's almost like we're taking over the role of a configuration management tool. So say a configuration management, something like Ansible or Chef or Puppet, where I create a provider block or provisioner block where I wanna just SSH a file or SCP a file over to um, the new server that I built. I can do that with a null resource. I can say uh, there's file provisioners, there's um, SSH provisioners, so I can run commands instead of just pushing the file over. So a lot of times what I'll end up doing is pushing all the files over and then I'll run an SSH execution that'll actually just run um, the commands that I'm gonna run on those files or execute the files that I pushed over. We have, that's the remote exec provisioner. So you can actually see that's exactly what they did. They pushed the file over using SSH um, and then they run you know, the app get command, app update, uh, they install the patchy on here. Um, and then it looks like they've got some variables that get passed into their HashiCat application. And they're doing that also with SSH here. Um, we, have a, we have our private key, and it looks like we have an AWS key pair. That, that, that's another resource that we're getting out of AWS. So let's go back to the shell. Okay, so we created all this. You can see that we have a Terraform output. This is the URL that we need to hit. If I wanted to see what else was created, I could do a Terraform show. And you can see the list of all of the things that it created, which is insane. So it, here's the thing. So I did a very similar, I was actually doing some um, hiring at my last company. And one of the things that I, I asked everybody to do before you know, we, we went to the interview is, hey, go write some Terraform code. Create a web server that tells me what your favorite coffee shop was. And I want you to do it in cloud. And it was just, just a normal, like you can do it in CloudFormation, you can do it in Terraform, you can do it in whatever tool, you know, Python, whatever you wanted to build it in. Well, did a great job. One of the guys came in, um, did Terraform. Another person wrote it in Python, which is great. It was, it was his tool of choice. The problem is, is that when he left, I got off that conversation with him. 
He didn't leave me the, uh, he left me the code, but I couldn't do anything with it because it was only a gener I was only generating the infrastructure. I was not destroying it. With Terraform, I've created all this infrastructure. I could go in here right now, do a Terraform destroy, get rid of all the infrastructure, and then bring it back up within another minute. Right, so I have a Terraform update and apply and a delete all from the same command. This is one of the differences between Terraform and say like an Ansible, right? With Ansible, I can create the code to provision the infrastructure, but because there's no state file to manage that, I then have to go write the code to, to delete that infrastructure. So what we usually say when we're talking about configuration management tools like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, is that Terraform, we usually build the house and then Ansible, you know, all the configuration management we use to kind of put the dressing on the house, like the siding and, you know, the, the window blinds and all that kind of stuff. So there, there, there is a place for both. Uh, we have a very good better together story with uh, most configuration management tools. All right. Do a quick check. Oh, we should have gone to this URL. Oh, good. We have a cat. Welcome to FedEx app. I've replaced this with text of your own meow world. It's, it's pretty good. It's a pretty good app. All right, let's see. Uh, we're going to do a Terraform graph again to see what's changed. I'm sure there's a lot more resources and variables out here. So we're going to start that Blast Radius server. Um, again, I've not used the Blast Radius server, but it, does, it actually seems kind of cool. Um, start up Blast Radius with this. Oh, he spelled it wrong. Maybe? Is, it, is that what it says? Already in use. Yeah, I, reading's hard when talking. All right, so we did that already, and now we want to go see. It already create, did it for me. So this is the new Terraform graph, right? Here's all the dependencies. It looks like a crazy dependency graph, which it is. Um, I don't find this to be very useful in general once it gets too big, but it's kind of cool once you start seeing clusters, um, you know, what the dependencies are. And the reason they call it blast radius is, hey, if I'm going to destroy a resource, what other dependencies are there? What, what are the things that are that gonna, is that going to affect? So you could technically use this to just go... Pinpoint the instance that you're going to use and figure out all the different things that are dependent on that AWS instance, right? That Elastic IP has to be deleted. The um, association of the Elastic IP, uh, you know, you keep going up the stack here and you can see all the different things that are dependent on that instance. Do a quick check. It's quiz time. All right. What happens when you run Terraform apply without specifying a plan file? Terraform runs without a plan. Terraform reads the previous plan and then applies it. Terraform runs a new plan right before the apply or none of the above. Anybody want to answer? Terraform, Terraform runs a new plan right before that apply. That's what I'm going to guess. <laughs> Hate to be wrong. Okay, Terraform provisioners run once at creation time. They do not run subsequent applies because that first apply or the init actually downloads that provisioner. Um, and then everything after that ha is stored in the state file. So um, they do not run on subsequent applies except in special circumstances like this training lab because in between the last challenge and this challenge, they probably destroyed it and recreated it. So. Oh yeah, it looks like we have a new uh, set of infrastructure. We have the cow say, I don't know if you've seen this before. This is kind of funny. Oops. We're going to install apt get install cow say. Okay, cow say moo. There you go. So we've got a little, a little cow, ASCII art that says moo. That's really fun. Okay, so um, Terraform apply. We're going to approve that. Okay, what, what am I doing here? After copying them into your buffer, it'll be easier to paste them in. Oh, okay. So we're going to add this to our Terraform as an output. Scroll down so you find the remote exec provisioner block and then following two lines at the end of the inline. Okay, so we're going to go to the main.tf. We're going to go to the bottom here. Where is it that they want it to go? Remote exec. Okay. And then we're going to say, 
Yeah, let's see. Oh, well, placeholder. All my uh, VS Code VM, Vim bindings aren't working for some reason. Okay. Uh, apt y install not j. Sudo. Then cal say do. Okay, want to save that. And after copying them into your buffer, it'll be easier to paste them, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to do a little bit of Terraform format, which I like. Ah, what am I missing? Missing item separator. Do, 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 do. I have a comma. Is that what it is? Oh, yeah, I need commas in here. Those commas get me. And I think with HCL, I can put one on the last one, which is really weird if you're into JSON. But I think it's also unnecessary, which is kind of funny. Um, all right, so that probably changed. Yep, that's good, all right. Terraform apply. Lock equals false. So now our, in our Terraform, it's going to go run that and we'll see it, which is kind of cool. So how many people here have actually used Terraform? No? Okay. Are you guys developers? Okay. No? <laughs> are you on the infrastructure side? Are we, are, what kind of applications are you building? AI stuff. Oh, fun. Okay. So you still need to build infrastructure for that AI, for jobs that are running. Very cool. Okay, so this is going to take a second. Um, again, so it's installing the CalSay app. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. Now we can see a cow saying moo in our Terraform output, which is fun. So let's go to the cat app URL one more time. The cat's still there. And we have a cow saying moo. We'll check that. So basically what we've gone over so far is input variables, output variables, resources, providers, um, our Terraform graph, our Terraform format, the different, um, the different steps that happen when you do a Terraform plan, the state file. Um, these are all very important when you're working through all, these, all this Terraform. Uh, it's saying Terraform can mix text along with Terraform data in your outputs. Outputs can be used to convey useful information. Very good. Terraform refresh command will sync your state file with what exists in your infrastructure. A refresh command will not change your infrastructure. So it just goes out and sees what else is out there. Um, and then Terraform output is, if you want to, okay, so I just did a Terraform show. That showed me all of the, var the values of the attributes of the resources that are created. You can actually specify a specific Terraform output for one attribute, and then you can take that attribute the, um, and the path to get to that attribute and then create an output variable that you can use later. On the outputs tab, so this is, we're actually going to go through and, and edit the outputs file. So in the outputs.tf, Right now, we have the cat app URL, which we said before. And a second output for, so this is really nice when you're writing. I don't know if you guys have um, used the Git, what is it? What's the new AI Git thing? Copilot? That thing's so cool. But like if, you're, if you just type in output right here, it'll fill out the whole thing for you. It even thinks about what you're about to type, which is really weird. Um, I think my theory on that is that it's actually looking at your paste buffer and it knows what you're about to paste, and then it like fills out the, the information. It's really crazy. Anyways, output, uh, we're going to name it cat app IP, and then we're going to open bracket, close bracket, value is equal to, oh, they're going to make me go look for a public IP. Uh, name your output, public underscore IP. Is that right? I don't think that's... No. Yeah, I think it actually has to point to the resource, which is... 
Yeah, Terraform show. I want. You wanted the public IP? Is that what I asked for? Yeah, the public the IP. Web, web server. Uh huh. It looks exactly like that app URL. Oh, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but public IP. Yeah. Yeah, so, so just to kind of go back here. If you go through our Terraform show command, we want to get access to the HashiCat resource that we created, right? So, um, and then the public IP is, so security group, route table. So this is how you do it. You look for the actual resource and the name. I'm trying to find the actual instance here. Instance, here we go. AWS instance, HashiCat, and then there'll be an IP in here. Um, here you go. Private IP, public IP. In this case, we're going to use the public, uh, public IP. And now, what you, see, whoops. what you see up here is that we actually wanted to take that information and then put it into a string. So we use the, you know, the, the context of a variable, so the dollar sign brackets, and then the actual value. Because we're not actually, this isn't a string, we can actually call it directly, so we can say AWS EIP, HashiCat, public IP. Then we'll save it. And then do our Terraform apply again, or Terraform refresh. I thought I had to do it apply. So the refresh is actually going out and looking through all of the resources that were created, and now you can see the IP is now set, set up here. Um, and that should be good. And we can actually do a Terraform output to just show us the output instead of all the extra stuff. All right, so we Terraform show, Terraform refresh, and Terraform output are additional commands you can use um, with Terraform binary. Okay, we talked about order of precedence before. We'll kind of go over it one more time. Um, the, the variables have five levels of precedence, like one to five, right? So the first one is if I run the Terraform command, I can throw in the variables flag, a command line argument. So I can say ver dash dash variable, you know, name equals value. Uh, I can use the configuration file, your terraform.tf vars file, an environment variable. So I can actually call that from, you know, an in bash or a shell script, an environment variable, and set that as part of your, um, your shell environment. So I can do a capital TF underscore var, and then the actual variable name. I could edit the variables.tf, and then if, if anything else, I can just replace it with a manual entry. Here are some other fun placeholder sites you can try with the placeholder variable. Okay, let's just, I don't know what, what this means, but. Oh, okay, I got it. So these are cat images. Got it. <laughs> okay, fun with variables. There are several ways to configure Terraform variables. So far, we've been using Terraform to TFR. So again, we're going to pass in, it looks like, a variable from the command line. And you'll, you'll see that, yeah, we've already called this in the Terraform uh, TFRs file, but now we're going to call this um, dash lock equals false. And we're going to see that these get applied over the vars file that's already created. And then we'll set the environment variable that Terraform can read. So again, instead of passing in the variable file, I'm going to actually pass in an environment variable from like the shell command, right? So if I want to set a variable in bash or in shell script, I can say export variable name equals and the value. If we put, if we precede that value with tf underscore var equals and then the name of the, the variable, that'll actually replace what's set up in your variables.tf file. Again, lower in precedence than if you're going to do this with the variables flag. Um, so we're going to do this. So we're setting on the environment variable, and then we're going to do a Terraform apply again with My placeholder is now going to be placedog.net, so I think we'll probably get a dog image. Actually, if we go to placedog.net, I feel like we're going to get a dog. Yes, we'll get one of these images in our next HashiCat app.
Okay, so it's going to run this again, um, and you can see the difference in precedence there, right? Um, so we click on our app here, and in our cat app, we have a picture of a white dog, which I like dogs better than cats anyway, so I'm good. Although I have more goats than I do dogs. All right. Another quiz. So Terraform variables. You have same variables set in your TFRs file, and you have an environment variable. Which one takes precedence? Anybody? Hands? Remember? TFRs are environment variable. Higher precedence? Did I hear something? Lower precedence. So technically, your TFR, actually, no, I'm sorry. I was reading that wrong. Yes, you're right. See? <laughs> That's what I meant. It's The precedence goes, TFR's file is a higher precedence than the variable's file. Your value that you pass in on the Terraform command line is a higher precedence. So, but the environment variable sits below that terraform.tfrs file. Terraform Cloud remote state storage is free for all users. So if you're using Terraform Cloud, we're actually going to open up a Terraform Cloud account here. Terraform Cloud remote state, um, when we talk about remote state, that means I can, when I do that apply, a state file is created locally. So I, I can actually show you that state file. Um, this one's generated automatically, so I can just cat this file. And you can see, th these are all the resources in JSON format. I don't know if they have JQ, but cat pipe to JQ, whoops, JQ-R. Hey, now I can see it in green. Um, so you can, this is a state file. So I can either manage it here or I can manage it remotely. And when I say remote, I can use things like S3. I can use DynamoDB to manage the locks on that S3 bucket. But Terraform Cloud allows you to store that state file and manage the state file and the different attributes of the state file in Terraform Cloud. And when you do that, it actually adds a bunch of additional metadata to do health differences and all that kind of stuff. OK, so we're going to go. Um, I've already pre-created. I have an app.terraform.io. Um, we're going to create a new organization in that um, Terraform org. And then we're going to be prompted to create a new workspace. So it's. The, the hierarchy in Terraform Cloud goes um, organization, and then you have multiple workspaces that are in an organization. There's also now a new thing called a project, so you can have an organization, you can have multiple projects, and then workspaces can be assigned to a project. So say you had a network team, a instant, you know, the server team, the AI team, and the database team, and they all are part of the same project, but different people have different attributes. The workspaces can be managed um, based on the team you're on, and then, but they can all be a part of a larger project. But I think they're using an older version, so just in this case, we're going to do organization and then workspace. Um, and then, so we're going to we're going to do this. I just happen to have a login here, so this will make it a little bit faster. I have all kinds of organizations. Um, if Cam Banowski is watching, you'll get to see his Shibashio uh, organization. Okay, so let's create a new organization called HashiCat. I just want to make sure I get this. HashiCat-AWS, oh, I know. Organization called Dan-Training. So we'll call it FedTech, FedDev-Training. At my email address, create an organization. So now I have a new organization. The first thing you need when you're in an organization is a workspace. So there's a couple ways you can do uh, workspace management. You can either do it through CLI, API-driven workflow, or version control, meaning if I write code and I apply it to my Git repo and it's on a certain branch, um, or if it's in a certain directory on a certain branch, the version control workflow will pick it up and automatically deploy that infrastructure out into the world. We are... I always use the VCS, so this is going to take me a second. CLI-driven workflow. That's what we're going to go through now. All right. And then we're going to name this. And I think it said HashiCat-AWS is the workspace. Uh, organization, CLI-driven. 
Note if you already have a HashiCat AWS workspace, please delete it, which we did not do, so it's fine. Um, this doesn't talk about projects. Again, I can apply this workspace and add it to a project, but I'm gonna, for in this case, just add it to the default project. And then I'm gonna call it HashiDog. And I'm gonna create the workspace. Okay, so now I've got this hierarchy. We've got organizations and we have workspaces. Teams, different teams have access to different workspaces, right? So if I'm on the network team, I might have my workspace for building VPCs out. If I'm on the database team, I might have my workspace for building out a specific database. Um, if I'm running a job for AI, I would have the AI workspace and I would be able to provision infrastructure around the job that I'm running. Okay, CLI driven workspace. So you can actually see here how we're going to take, we're gonna put this in our, um, this configuration block in our main.tf. I would put this in maybe my um, backend, I, I usually call it the backend.tf. Um, this basically shows us how, where we're gonna store our remote state. And we're saying in this case, we're gonna put it in Terraform Cloud, we're gonna put it in the FedDev training organization, and we're going to apply it to the workspace HashiCat-AWS. So now I'll be able to manage the state within Terraform Cloud. If I was actually running this through VCS, you can actually see the version controlled uh, GitHub repo right here. I could click through it and see the changes that are happening. In this case, we're not, so we're just gonna take this example code. Uh, we're gonna do Terraform version. Okay. All right, what does it say? Uh, recreate as above. Doing this avoids possible problems. Mismatch state. Execution mode. Oh, okay. So in here, in your general settings, in our Terraform cloud, wherever that is, yeah, there we go. In our general settings, we wanna set our remote state to local, I think is what it said. Um, Terraform cloud version. Execution mode to local. Uh, execution mode is set to local. Now, I talked about output variables, variables before. If I wanted to share the output variables of this workspace with another workspace, I could do that. I can also say share it with whoever wants this information. So one reason I'd wanna do that, say if I had a VPC that I built, but I wanna share it with all of my workspaces because they're all gonna be in this workspace or all in this VPC, I would just say share with, share with all workspaces my VPC. Um, so that's that and I'm gonna hit save. Is there anything else I need to do? Did I miss anything else? Doing this avoids possible problems with a mismatched state. Oh, it wanted me to do version. Um, yeah. Okay. So we're gonna do a quick check. Okay, with local execution mode, Terraform commands and variables all remain in your workstation. So I'll make the code changes locally on my, in my shell. And then when I type in Terraform apply, they'll remain on my workspace, my workstation. With remote execution mode, Terraform runs in the cloud. So the actual runner is no longer on my laptop. It's actually running on a, um, a remote runner that Terraform cloud actually runs or uh, manages. And then that can, there's basically a container environment that spins up. All variables must be configured in the cloud environment. So in Terraform, in the cloud environment, you can actually go to the workspace, go to settings. Um, oh, I don't have remote states turned on, which is why I don't see any variables, but normally you'd have variables set up right here, which we're probably gonna do here in a second. Okay, so now we're gonna edit the remote backend.tf file and we're gonna replace your organization placeholder with the org name that we created. So we're gonna go into the remote backend.tf and we're gonna swap this guy out with the name that I gave it, which was feddev-training. All right, and we're gonna save that file. All right, now we're gonna generate a new user token. So we have to go to this URL to get a new token. So now, 
what I'm doing here is similar to what you'd see um, with your AWS resources. If I want to do something locally and I want to interact with Terraform, I need to have a credentials.tf file. So I'm going to go first create a token in Terraform. You can see I've created quite a few of them. Actually, I'm not going to create another one because I've got one already created. And I will bring up my terminal. Credentials.tf file. So this is what the file looks like. Um, you can see the token there. Great, now you guys can all run. I will definitely delete that as we speak. <laughs> Probably should have done that beforehand. Cool. So actually, I'm going to create a new API token and not show you and show you that. Uh, so we're going to call this the HashiCat user token. Generate token. And we're going to copy that. And we're going to go into my Terraform file. It's actually going to have us log in. So um, select the credentials file tab, open the credentials file, which is in here. Is there a tab? Oh, there you go. Thank you. Direct it or edit it directly like that. We're going to save that. All right, place your token with that, and now you'll see it in the credentials file. T Terraform credentials. All right, we're going to do a Terraform init. All right, and we're supposed to get that, right? Dude, I must have missed that. Uploading state conflict. This workspace is not locked. I'm in the weird. I knew it would bite me eventually. Um, Terraform apply. Oh, okay. All right, come on. No such file, but it, it exists. Okay, it's no longer there. Terraform, init. Open Terraform. No such file directory. I know it doesn't exist because I just killed it. So if this doesn't work, I'm going to keep moving. Lock equals. So this is not something we normally deal with. Um, this is, I think, part of the lab here, which needs to be updated. So now I've got a state conflict. So we're going to just skip past this um, and move on to the next section here because I don't feel like dealing with troubleshooting. OK, so Terraform can destroy that infrastructure that we just built, right? So we want to be able to destroy that. Hopefully, we're in a state we can. Now that I've killed the Terraform.lock file, Form. We have the state file, doesn't matter. So I'm going to terraform destroy. Lock equals false. Hopefully, yeah. I'm going to keep running into this, which is awesome. Skip this. So terraform destroy would go through and destroy all my infrastructure, which I'm going to have it do on its own. Okay, so that's it. That's all the terraform. Um, again, what did we go over? We went through all the different commands with Terraform, right? Terraform validate, Terraform format, Terraform graph, Terraform show, Terraform output. Um, we, we showed how to build infrastructure. We talked about the input variables, the output variables, how to link output variables from one workspace to another workspace. The, I 
felt like we could have done a better, a better job with the lab as far as getting to Terraform Cloud, um, but this is more of an open source thing anyway, so for the most part, we went over most of the Terraform open source commands that we can use. Um, so that is the first lab, um, which is uh, Introduction to Terraform.